Okay. Then we are set. Uh, good morning again. We'll <coughs> do a lecture on um, international trade, uh, which I think you should know a little bit about in a course like this, because it's uh, it's so important for I mean uh, the whole idea of uh, international transportation. I mean, it's, it's there for facilitating uh, international trade. At the same time, international trade would have looked completely different without, uh, without international transportation. Because trade is dependent upon the possibility to move cargo, commodities, and people around the globe. So that's, that's uh, so it's a kind of an, interaction here and um, to to know a little bit about the mechanisms of international trade is uh, is important for you if you are going to <coughs> to work as uh, as planners as i said at the introductory lecture to to be able to understand some of the mechanisms that can be uh, which can be useful for you um, so i will go through a few uh, elements or a few things that describes how the, the, the global trade looks like, uh, say a few words about uh, potentials, um, say a little bit about freight transport demand and what is sort of at the more micro level uh, causing demand for different transport modes. And finally, <coughs> I, will, I will go through this theory, which is a part of your, uh, your uh, readings uh, for, uh, for this lecture. So when we are done with this, hopefully you will have a <coughs> slightly better idea of the complex uh, relationship between uh, mechanism related to trade and uh, and also then the international transportation. We start at a bit, uh, let's say, uh, strategic level, and then we will work ourselves towards uh, a more transport mode specific uh, uh, description and analysis towards the the end of this this course. So the growth is, even if we have had some difficulties uh, in the global economy during the last, say, five years, the growth is now starting to catch up again. And um, we are uh, facing, I'm not going to hide, just collect this one. Um, we are now facing a four to five percent growth <coughs> in world GDP uh, in the years to come, and that is that is actually quite a lot uh, because, as we shall see, the volume is, is is quite high at the outset. It differs a bit between advanced economies. And advanced in this sense is uh, it sh should perhaps be defined, but we are talking in and about, let's say, developed market economies, like within the OECD area. Um, and then five to six percent growth per year in emerging economies. And among these, and among those, you will find uh, uh, Latin America, which. Uh, a lot of you come, come from, and, uh, and uh, the African continent, parts of Asia, and, and so forth. So we see that the, the, the speed of growth is, is, is higher, stronger, in the developing part of the world. Uh, Have any of you heard about the Marshall Aid that was given to Europe after the Second World War? Mm. 
No? None of you heard about that? No. Well, after the Second World War, <coughs> Europe was, uh, it was a lot of destruction during the bombing and, and everything. Uh, so Europe had a very, very, very weak state of affairs. Not much production was going on. Uh, everything was more or less, uh, it was not, not a very good state. Europe was in a very bad, bad state. But the United States of America was, uh, was still quite prosperous, even if they had also suffered some losses during the Second World War. So what the, <coughs> what the um, United States of America did, and it was the Minister of Commerce, which name was Marshall, who proposed to give Europe a large, very large sum of money, I don't remember how, exactly how big it was, to grant it to Europe, say here is the money. You should start reconstructing your your uh, your uh, production equipment and your institutions, so uh, so that you are going uh, <coughs> coming back on your feet again, quite quite fast. And that worked. And what what the underlying sort of thinking there had to do with international trade. Because it takes at least two parties to trade. And I'll show you towards the end of the course the theory behind that thinking. Why trade between parties could benefit both parties. It benefits different groups within uh, each of the trading partners, that's, that's for sure. But all in all, it benefits both countries. So. Uh, U.S., the United States of America, did that as an investment because it cost a lot of money in the short run. But they did it as an investment to stimulate economic growth, both in their own country and at their trading partners. And that has been an issue of concern among uh, economists for, well, I would say almost at least 70 to 80 years, how to get a balanced international trade. Because the trade between developing and, let's say, developed or more advanced economies traditionally has been more or less a one-way road where uh, raw materials, um, flows then from the uh, developing countries and towards the, the, the developed or more, more advanced economies. And not much going back. <coughs> so traditionally, if we go not more than 50 years back, that was the case. Not much, let's say, um, reciprocity in the trade flows. Raw materials one way, and then uh, the raw materials uh, were then cheap uh, production factors in the developed economies, production systems, which was not, it was not of much benefit to the developing countries. That has started to change a bit. If you consider China, for instance, a big, powerful nation, s not anymore, at not, not at least uh, the headlines are not telling uh, or characterizing them as a developing uh, economy in terms of being slightly underdeveloped. It is, a, it is starting to be a <coughs> very advanced um, uh, country for, uh, for manufacturing. Which, was, which is a, a quite new phenomenon in the global sense. Because they are now start, they, they are doing trade with manufactured goods. Traditionally being a developing country, but they have, by means of foreign direct investments, countries let, like uh, France, the US, England, and partly also Norway, 
have invested in factories, equipment, and they are doing the production there. Also benefiting, um, you can say a lot about this benefits as well, but the big picture is that the also the, the Chinese economy in this case becomes more, more advanced and in a better position to, to have a balance of power with the big uh, traditionally, uh, let's say, advanced Western economies like the US and the European economy. So, um, <coughs> this strong growth, stronger than here. Why do you think the growth numbers, why are the growth numbers stronger here in the emerging <coughs> economies, developing economies, than in the advanced economies? There are some simple explanations behind that. Any ideas? Why the growth is stronger here than here? Maybe that the uh, potential for growth is bigger in the emerging markets than in the already developed markets. The potential is bigger. Uh, but what kind of potential could we could we think about? I'm just trying to, to, to make you go a bit behind the numbers because this is kind of what we are going to train a bit of analytical skills. You see some percentages, you see some differences, and you should start thinking why why do you have wh why do we have those differences? Because it's, it's correct, there is a larger potential. Uh, but I wonder why is it so? This is what, what uh, analysts are sort of tr trying to address all the time. And then the next question is what is the implications of that? And what could happen in the future? And so on. But I can give you one, <coughs> one hint, labor. Labor, labor force. And then you say. What's your mother tongue? Okay, say, say it in Norwegian. I'll translate it. Yeah, you 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 are saying that outsourcing may be one explanatory factor and one one potential. And if you m by outsourcing mean that production that takes place in in Europe, U.S. and those countries are moved to the these countries, I I also agree with that. But why is it profitable to move it? from from Europe or the US and to China or wherever. Labor costs. Labor yeah. The potential <coughs> lies to an, to a very significant extent in the fact that there is so much labor avail available there. Because, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, there are lots of problems with that, of course, because uh, people are not sitting around doing nothing, but they are employed in sectors that are quite labor intensive, where you can replace labor with, uh, with uh, let's say, machinery in the, in the shorter run, and you can transfer, you can train people to let's say move from 
in the Chinese case, from agriculture to industry. So there is a, it's a very, it's a large potential for, let's say, moving people from inland to the coast where the industry production takes place in that country, and the, and the labor costs are very low. Um, I think some 80 to 100 million people moved from inland to the, the coastal strip of China during a 10-year period. Think about that, 80 to 100 million people. They are going to have infrastructure, food, housing, and so on. So it's not without problems. <coughs> but uh, the numbers are then quite, quite, uh, quite clear. The potential as, uh, for transferring labor from, uh, from uh, let's say, more low productive sectors in terms of, of, uh, of labor productivity and towards higher labor productivity sector is th that potential is much stronger in the in the in the developing countries so that is one one strong explanation for this <coughs> um, that there are more resources available for uh, for uh, to 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 be able to take this this uh, and to sort of support this growth um, <coughs> so they grow faster now than they used to um, as I, I mentioned si China, that this, this uh, thriving Chinese economy is a, is a driver for this. Um, searches of activities, they go a bit up and down. We had a downturn in 2009, as I, as I mentioned on the introductory lecture, but it c comes back again. So. The demand, <coughs> at least up to now, the demand for the manufactured services uh, and the products that are m manufactured in, in China and elsewhere, the demand is in, the, in Japan, US, US, and I should also mention Europe, of course, here. <coughs> so it's strong, the growth is strong. It has been, um, been, uh, been stronger earlier on. Uh, a bit weaker now than it used to be some, some 10 years ago, but still, as I said, around 5%. Uh, another, another thing worth noting here, then, is that the GDP gross domestic product per capita in developing countries <coughs> are not very large at the outset. So if you take a percentage growth on a small number, I mean the, the growth per capita in terms of money may be stronger here, but in percent can still be stronger in the developing part of the world. So here is uh, it's a graph showing uh, some of some um, developing patterns. Uh, these are the developed countries. We see the downturn in 2009. And we have the trends. Um, and this is, uh, this is for the emerging economies, emerging countries with a much, much higher, much higher growth. Um, but they are quite, they are quite, uh, quite correlated as we, as we see here. And uh, these fluctuations causes some challenges uh, with respect to planning of uh, international transport services, as we will touch upon more later on in the course.
Here we have uh, <coughs> development in, in global investments. And uh, quite a lot of this is, uh, is uh, in this part of the world, the developing economies, are foreign direct investments. Countries which invests in other countries because they can make more money out of that, of course. And the reason for that has to do with the potentials that, that I mentioned. And it has also to do with some taxation issues, which I mentioned on the, on the previous lecture, that uh, some of the developing countries, they are giving tax reliefs or tax exempts for, for uh, foreign direct investments which makes, makes them, of course, more attractive. So you can, it's hard to beat the combination of a good potential and favorable taxes when you, when you are thinking of doing foreign direct investments. And this is uh, investments in manufacturing equipment that we are uh, talking about here. And uh, so we see that the traditional high investment activity in the, in the developing high income countries, in the low income countries, they are the predictions are that there will be of a share of around 50% each in, in the years to come. And this tells us something <coughs> about the shift in, let's say, the division of, uh, of, uh, of labor, of division of what we are going to work with over the whole, let's say, in, in, the, in the world, that uh, we are expecting more activity to take place in the developing part of the world. And then we are traditionally talking about uh, parts of Latin America, Africa, and East Asia. And to be able to use this information for, uh, for long-term planning, we, we need to, of course, to break it down into, into regions and to see how this will develop. <coughs> and uh, the World Bank is, uh, is uh, publishing the Global Economic Outlook every year, which contains a lot of information about, about trends broken down into, into specific regions. So, <coughs> There was a forecast <coughs> back in some eight, eight, seven, eight years back that the GDP growth will, will, would slow down. <coughs> Nobody, or at least not many, could foresee the, the big downturn that took place in 2009. But there was a perception that something was about to happen. Because the investment cycle had peaked in the, in the United States, uh, the world demand had outstripped supply, and when that happened, what will be the result? If world demand outstrips supply, you have pressure on on the demand, certain pressure. What will happen then? If you think, you can think about, for instance, uh, <coughs> the market for crude oil, iron, steel, raw materials that are used in manufacturing. What will happen? <coughs> Quantity 
you know, the price and the costs. And um, you have a demand, which simply says that when, when prices go down, demand increases. So if you have a given price level like this, and you, and you shift the prices downwards for some reason, quantity will increase. So if, uh, <coughs> if we can introduce then just a supply curve, here, which tells a slightly different story, namely that when, when prices go up, more producers or a larger quantities will be supplied to the market, but at a higher price in this case, because the curve is turning upwards. So as, <coughs> as more and more is supplied to the market, the costs increases. And this, <coughs> this can be, by means of econometrics and statistical analysis, you could one can try to estimate how a supply curve looks like, and one can try to estimate how a demand curve looks like. When you have <coughs> a growth in GDP over, it, over the years, and the gross domestic product is growing, means that every citizen, on average, gets a higher income. And when you get a higher income, the demand, the demand curve is shifted, as we say outwards from, from, uh, from this point. And it means that for, <coughs> for a given, for a given price, we can simply purchase more. The budget is, has increased. That is what this is saying. But if we don't have a supply curve like this, I will just this is a nice thing about blackboards. you can just wipe it out. And I remember when I was a student, I was so annoyed with lectures that did what I just did now. <laughs> so I remember that. But what, what, what will happen here now is that this is. This is the market equilibrium, let's say, back in 2005 or something like that. And then GDP grows. <coughs> we get a new equilibrium, but we get it at a higher price. So what I'm saying with this sentence is that as people get more prosperous, prices will go up because of this, this effect. We demand more, it costs more to produce what is demanded, and prices go up. And some of the, some of the nice uh, effect of income increase will then sort of disappear or, or it will be reduced. Because if the, if the supply curve had looked more, more like this, it's a lower, it, it's, it's lower down, so it's, uh, 
you can produce a lot more with lower costs. Let's say if this, this effect with a not so sharply rising supply curve would have been that the price increase from such a change would have been much smaller as compared to this situation. So this crunch or let's say price rise from income increase will, de will depend upon the shape of the supply curves. If it is, if the, the supply curve is entirely flat, meaning that you have no capacity problems in the, uh, on the supply side in the economy at all, then we won't have that effect. But when we are in a situation where we have capacity issues, that the production capacity is limited, the supply curve will start to, to increase. And it may increase much sharper than I have illustrated here. So this is also part of the picture when you talk about uh, when you are down to, let's say, the transportation issues here. We can uh, collect statistics, what will happen, what will happen with the GDP. But then we also need to know what will happen with the commodity prices. Will they go up? Will they rise sharply? Let, which happened to, to the steel. Steel prices rose sharply around 2005 to 2008 because of the high demand. So demand out outstrips supply. The steel prices rocketed. And that has consequences. Uh, for the demand for steel transport, of course. But because this, the, the increase in steel prices affects the prices of consumer goods that uses steel for production. And then we have a kind of a, what you might call a kind of rebound effect in this, in this market, that, that prices go up demand is, is, uh, is then uh, s uh, slowing down. And the volumes, the trade volumes, will also be, be lower because of the capacity problems. It's a long story about a very short sentence. <laughs> Higher interest rates. Um, that is also about shortage of capital. Because uh, when, uh, when you have a very high demand for capital, the interest rates will go up. Because in the interest rates, it's simply the prices of employing capital in production. More strict fiscal policies <coughs> is also um, an issue that affects uh, GDP growth. Does any have you any ideas of what this sentence means? It's very common in the economic literature to talk about fiscal policies and budgetary issues. Yeah, uh, I'll try to translate this. <laughs> uh, what, what it means is that you can expand the activity level within a country or within a region by just spending more money. Let's say if you, if you want to build uh, transport infrastructure 
which has been a hot topic in, in Norway. More transport infrastructure costs a lot of money. And when you have a, <coughs> when you have a national budget, which is uh, in principle the same as uh, the budget that we have as, as, uh, as individuals, you can, uh, you can uh, borrow and uh, you can buy a nice car or a house or uh <coughs> at the individual level or new roads, railways and so on at the national level. <coughs> and you can borrow money to do that. And as long as you keep the borrowing of money at, at, a, at a level that you can pay off you can pay off your mortgages or your loans during a given number of years. It's not a big issue, as long as you take care of that in the proper way. But some countries <coughs> has not been very, let's say, not too concerned with budgetary deficits. So they are just expanding their activity level. And sooner or later, if they borrow too much money, things will collapse. You remember perhaps back to 2009 and uh, the collapse that started with, in Europe, it started with Greece. You remember that? They had borrowed too much money uh, <coughs> and the, the, let's say the production of, uh, of um, goods and services in the country was not high enough to cover all the loans that I have taken up and then things started to collapse. Um, bankruptcies and everything that goes with it. So what nations do then? <coughs> and this in this case the European Union they started to work with Greece and they started to work with uh, some other economies as well, the Irish one, the Spanish one, to try to make those countries, to get them back on their feet again by putting demands on public spending to avoid and to, to avoid uh, further um, uptake of loans and to get some of the mortgages paid down and to, let's say, get a better balance. But in the short run, it means that demand is restricted. So uh, when, in, when you have to pay back something, you can think of yourself, if you start to pay back your your uh, mortgages that you have sort of taken up, for instance, to, to attend or to, to attend this study program. If you speed up the, 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 the pace of paying back your, your debts, you can spend less on goods and services. <laughs> and if everybody does that, you may get problems as a nation, because then too little is consumed. And when you consume, it will take, it may take uh, in this figure, the demand for goods and services will shift in this direction. Because, not because people earn less, but because they have less to spend because of maybe taxation, maybe they have to, to start paying back their debts in a, at a higher rate per, per year and so, so on and so forth. So then prices may go down again, but the, but the national economy sort of contracts into a lower level which affects trade flows and then, it, and then eventually it will affect transport demand, capacity, uh, freight rates and so on. 
so it's a, it's a very complex picture. And lots of actions can contribute to how trade, how the uh, economic activity level develops. <coughs> and in turn, it affects the markets that we are going to, to work with in this course. And you can analyze quite a lot of it from a very simple graphs like this, actually. Inward shift because of this causes prices of commodities to drop, quantities of goods traded will be lower, and so on. Transport companies will start to struggle. Lead times may become longer because they need to fill the ships in China with fewer goods, less quantities of goods, and ta things take longer time. This is caused by a strong growth in GDP, higher prices, higher quantities, and higher demand for, for transport services. Perhaps <coughs> you need to increase capacity to serve all this. You get higher freight rates because the prices are higher. And everything goes nicely until things start to crack up like what happened in 2009. You need to contract the economic activity level in, uh, in certain countries. Back to this situation. So it's not nice. I mean, if you have been here, expanded capacity, build new ships, and suddenly down here with a very strong decrease <coughs> in demand for commodities. This is a, just a, I haven't put any name on this commodity, but it's, it's more a, a construct. But this is what happens. You have a peak, goes into this off or, or downturn, and, they, and there you go come back to this a bit in, in the next section. But then we break, I think. <coughs> <coughs>